And I would like to start with introducing ourselves. My name is Christian and I come from Latvia. My name is Andre and I come from Portugal. Mm -hmm. My name is Ustina and I come from Lithuania. Marina from Spain. I'm Amanda from Hungary. Veronica from Czech. I'm Nicholas, also from Lithuania. And I'm Honza from Czech. Yes, so we are uh, eight international students studying all together pedagogy. We are DNSD 2015, that's what we call ourselves. Travel and travel to learn. Slavery, religion, education, healthcare, waste management, social movements, unemployment. And the topic that I was part of was uh, about human rights and about the Arab Spring in Morocco. Because uh, after Morocco got its independence from uh, France, it was kind of like this shaky moment when there were not really parties to be elected, so it was. Suddenly just the government created some parties that were elected <coughs> and it was still like a very closed system. And uh, it's not easy to raise a whole society, like to recreate this kind of thinking, how to live in a democratic system and how to, how to uh, have human rights. During 2011 there was this so-called Arab Spring that there were many protests against all the oppression of the government and the king and uh, and then suddenly there was a change so they wrote a new constitution and then it already included human rights and then everybody thought that yeah something will change now because it's included in the constitution so but not so many not so so many changes have been done since then so when we went there we faced the issue that there are still everyday protests on the streets and there are many, many people who are out there and trying to defend their rights. They are trying to fight for sexual equality and uh, for human rights, for women rights. They are fighting against torture. And uh, it was something very powerful to experience is that you are there in the middle of this crowd and there's just this strong shouting and, and that these people are really fighting for something that I have since I was born. I always had this privilege that my rights were protected and, and... The main topic of the investigation in Gambia was education and it was something that I'm very interested in as a teacher. I wanted to find out more about the education system. So actually we chose, together with Honza, we chose to see different kind of sides of education. So to go to public schools, go to some private schools, go to the school, for example, for the disabled kids. Then that's the school. For the black <coughs> children, it was the only school in the Gambia and it was only accessible for 46 kids. And it is one of the challenges because there are many disabled kids in the country. There is no uh, teacher training uh, for the special needs kids. So the teachers, they go through the simple education system and then they have to be able to work in the school for, for example, such a blind kids. And another thing is what I saw that when we were going, when we had the tour around the school and then we went to one of the classrooms and then I saw that the teacher, she is also visually disabled herself. So she was able to give the lessons to the kids who had the same issue. And then I was talking with one of the men and he said that they are very much trying to move the step forward and actually involve these people because the society has this thing that they want to leave them behind and that it's very difficult to employ a person who is actually who has disability but they are trying to break the stereotype and they want to empower these people to actually be able to work 
ourselves in couples or trios and then we have a topic and we prepare like questions or what do we want to know how do we want to focus on it to learn and then we we go out of the bus and we say like we meet 500 kilometers from here in five or six days and in these five or six days we have to find out the Moroccans so they have built a wall going I don't know if you see this ground part that is what originally belongs to the Sahrawi people. Yeah, and we have a short uh, video from this process. This was for the violence against women. Because it's, moving because it's impossible to survive in there anymore. I mean, nothing grows. How do you feed your cattle? What do you drink? Etc. <laughs> The cars are extremely old, it looks like nobody yeah. would ever drive them. They are like just, I don't know, put together different pieces and it's like it's falling apart. Sometimes you cannot close the door and so on and it's just like, and you would not even imagine that this car would be able to drive, but it does. And you can never predict like yeah. that you're gonna, like the leaving time, there is no such a thing as when the bus is full, then you leave. Seven hours. Maybe. And it like so many times it broke down and I was traveling. Once the tire just exploded and it was so loud and we were just stuck there, I don't know, for quite a while until they found another tire or I don't know. But they always find solutions and always it's, it's magical. <laughs> Actually once uh, with Andre we were going, crossing the border from Minerisal to Senegal and going up and just we crossed the border and something in the car didn't work so it stopped. And it turns out that the suspension, sus suspension. suspension went out of the place. <laughs> understand a bit how it was, I would like to invite four people from you on stage. <laughs> there will be two people who will be the villagers, let's say. Come here. The rest are werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> and the um, other two, they will have to make yourself understand, but you cannot use English. <laughs> Like that, yeah. the whole body, like that, okay. and she can still move. 
Oh. Yeah, she has to like hold babies and dig what they're from the well, so we yeah. can be. You should throw all her. That's right. That's funny. Yeah. 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 I wanted to ask something about the ethnic groups. Uh, which, which ethnic group is the majority in uh, Mauritania? The majority? Is it African? Now there is 70% are Moors and then like 40 are Black Moors, 30 are White Moors. So 30% is this privileged. Mm. And you are out with your partner of the bus alone in the middle of nowhere, they just drop you out and it's a fully new continent, a new country, people don't speak your language and then you are just there and like, okay, I'm alone here with this other person and like, we have to find out where we will live and what we will eat and how we will do. I also felt a bit suspicious because he was straight like, what can I have? Like, thank you girls, and like, and we were like, mm, yeah, like, we were not sure, like, it shouldn't really happen that in the middle of nowhere there's like a person who's like super good in English and like has a car and like... But then it turned out very well, he took us to this family where we spent the rest of the week, seven days with. And it was amazing, this, this family, they had four kids and, and the parents and they just took us in and it was, it was super nice and they were so hospitable and we really felt like part of the family at some point. And then another very interesting thing is about these reef mountains that uh, most of these families, it's the, the ground is not so perfect, fertile. Yeah, so it's not, they are not really able to grow so many things. But what it's good for and what they can get money for is uh, growing hashish. So they are growing weed and that's most of the families they live from that, that they are producing weed for the cities and also for Europe. Uh, Morocco is like I think 70% of Europe wheat comes from Morocco, if I'm correct, hashish. And it was also interesting to learn how to how to do hash. And also somehow it puts it in another perspective for you because like before when I was like yeah, a teenager and then like we have a gram and now we are gonna smoke it, but there was like just tons of like big yeah. <laughs> big bags full of it with weed and they were just making this hash and it was like all over and everything smelled like hash, the whole house. And also like for the family to understand that it's not like for us to have fun, but for them it's about living or dying, like this is the only thing that they got money from. And then the whole family participates in the production. Every day there's this sound, this drumming sound that comes from all different parts of the mountains. Then we went and then we learned that it's like actually in our house there were like 5, 15, 16 years old boys who were like from the morning to the evening just just drumming the hash because they are like hitting it and then uh, the powder goes down and then yeah so th that's what they work was and then some evenings we also with the family like kids and adults we just got together and in the middle of the living room we just started to like separate the weed the good part and the bad part and like the kids the mom everybody together and it was something very weird first and also like okay but for them it's like it was actually a nice activity, like a common activity in the end of the day, because somehow it's something very different for them what it means than what it means for us, I think. I have a question. Is the production and growing these uh, plants illegal there? Yes. yes, it's illegal, but it's like 
Everyone it's like, like <coughs> yeah, yeah, almost yeah, secret, yeah, like everybody secret. knows about it. And, okay. and actually at some point the government wanted to do something about it and everyone went to protest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if they think that, oh, they cannot live with anything, like, yeah. Yeah. and it was very interesting. Yeah, like, you have no really. crops to plant, you have, like, how can you just switch like that? Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah. they also said that in this part of the mountains there is nothing else that would grow there, and then yeah, and then demand for this is so big that it's kind of the only thing they can. Do. And usually, if the people have work in these mountains, this is the only thing they do. They just grow wheat. There is nothing else. Another fact about this production because so the family they sell one gram for two three dirham, which is two three cent, and then these mafia, the dealers who collect it, they sell it already in the in the Moroccan cities for 20, 30 dirham, so like 10 times more, which is like 20 cents. And then when you think about it, when it comes to Europe, it's like even 10, mo 10 times more. So it's also like crazy that in the end, it's actually not them who profits from this yeah. whole mm -hmm. system. I would like to tell you a story. This man, uh, when he was 16 years old, he was a slave owner, so he was from the rich family and he could have slaves. But when he was 16, he started to go to the French Cultural Institute. And then in the library, he found a book about French Revolution. And he started to read that book. And in the book was written that all the men are free and all the people are equal in the world, even the men and women. And then he started to think, why is it that in the rest of the world there is no slavery, but in Mauritania it still exists. And then he started to talk with his family, and then he came back home, and then he said to all of his slaves that I let you go, because I don't want that you will live in this life anymore. And uh, it was very difficult at the beginning, because it was unacceptable to just let the slaves be in that time. But he was working very hard. Uh, to improve the situation and then together with other group of people, with volunteers, we created an organization which is called SOS Slaves and now he is working with that he wants to get out all the slaves from the slavery and uh, try to teach them different kind of jobs, for example how to use machine to make clothes or how to fix shoes that they will not be able to only do a physical job but they would also earn money. But uh, now it's estimated that still, till uh, this time, till 2016, there are around 10 or 20% of slaves in Mauritania. And it's not said publicly because government says that uh, slavery doesn't exist in the country anymore. So they deny. They, they say I remember the first time when we were traveling, it's like, in Europe, when you, you are on the bus, you usually like look for the spaces that are empty and then you pack your stuff and like you sit comfortably. And then we got in. <laughs> we got in and first was like, okay, it's super hot, let's try to sit next to the window and like, okay, how can we? But in the end, it didn't really matter because you just like, people were just coming in and in and there were like more and more people and in the end, you just got stuck and it was super hot and it was super sweaty and, and you couldn't move yourself and for six, seven hours you were sitting like that and, and it's loud. And then what was very interesting that at some point this uncomfortable situation and that you're struggling there, it started to turn into something very magical, I would say. Like, you were together with those people for six, seven hours and you were just stuck in there and you couldn't really move, but people were talking and they were sharing mandarins and peanuts around and, for example, the bus stops and then all these women from the side of the road, they run there with their, with their um, with their products, peanuts or water or something and then inside the bus from the back people pass the coin to the front and then in the front they buy something and they pass it back and then you share and somehow it's like at some point this whole bus inside these 20-25 people in this small bus they it becomes like a family trip kind of like you get to know the people who you are traveling with and, and you share food together never experienced such a trip before in Europe and there's, yeah, it's just so different the way how we are there and 
And then I had this realization after that <coughs> I use so much public transportation here at home and, and I never got so much out of it than I did there because I never really talked with anybody, I never really approached, I never really shared my food with just randomly somebody and it would be also like kind of weird but it was just like a shock of two realities like crushing. that when we enter Africa we will get this culture shock but I think at least personally for me I got more of cultural shock when we were coming back to Europe because we saw so much so much good there and such a big generosity and it's just people are so different that we came to Europe and then we realize how much individualist we are how we are not connected at all we don't care we don't yeah we don't care about our neighbors sometimes we don't even care about the same members of our family it's just like such a big such a big difference and that's why actually the, the continuous period it was bringing to the public and we chose our it to be humanizing like to make people a, a bit more humane than we are now and actually to remind that we are all the same no matter origin or race or sexuality or whatever that it's just we are all humans and we all deserve <laughs> Yes, we're